Adam Tomlinson and welcome to this very special episode of the High Bee Buzz sponsored by G4 Claims. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by a, a Hibernian FC legend, someone that's closing in on 500 appearances for the club, a multiple league title, Scottish Cup, League Cup winner with Hibernian women. Joel, thank you so much for, for sitting down to discuss the incredible career that that you've had firstly how are you doing you okay yeah i'm good thanks adam how are you yeah very good thank you um obviously you've been with hibernian women for for such a long time now and um it's probably feels like a long time ago when when you started um coming into into football and wanted to play but i want to take you all the way back there if that's okay um obviously you grew up on the borders can you remember the first time you had a, a football at your feet um yeah i think it was from a very early age. Um, my dad played football. He went into management, and I think from as as early an age as five, I wanted to to have a ball at my feet. And I think my my love, passion, and and desire to to play the game has kind of grown from from there. Yeah. What what was that? What was that like at at your age? Because I can't imagine there are many other girls kicking a football around at that age? No, there wasn't. I think not not only in, in the borders, but I think the women's game in general, there wasn't a kind of a big appetite for it. There wasn't any kind of girls only platforms. So I was always seen as a, an odd entity because it was always boys um, and then this one young girl. Um, but I, I never ever saw myself as a, a girl playing a, a kind of boys sport yeah I saw myself as a as a football player what what was that like as a young kid I don't know I think f for me I, I'm someone who kind of doesn't get phased by things like that and I kind of just used to shrug it off uh, you would always see and it was probably more the parents at, at a young age um they didn't want their their son to be beaten by a girl so the shouts would come um if I got the better of of their their son um, on the pitch, so yeah, I, I'm someone who doesn't get phased. It, it didn't really bother me, um, and I don't think it, it really bothered bothered my my family or or my parents when when they came to watch. I, I think they they quite enjoyed seeing me play, seeing me competing, and I, I think similar to to myself, they just saw me, their daughter, playing playing a sport that um, she really loved. Yeah, and do you play in a boys' team down on the borders? Yeah, I did. So I started off um, so from a, a small village called Chunside. Um, so I started with, with them. Um, and then I moved on to, to Coldstream, um, which is a, another small village just in the, the local area. So it was always boys' teams. Um, played five a side um, with actually Liam Craig, former former yeah. player of the, the club. So he himself came from from Chunside, so it was almost one of those ones where the the village was was quite proud of not only myself but also also Liam, um, a population of, and well, a very small population, and and two two players who have kind of played at the top end of the game. It's quite quite a proud thing for for the village. Yeah, absolutely. What, what was the the standard of and competitive nature of the football like on the borders? Yeah, it was good. Um, I think for for me, I obviously didn't have any anything else to to really compare it to, but it, it was decent. Um, I, I would always get stuck in. I, I wouldn't shirk or, or shy away from a a tackle. Um, my dad always said that if you go in half heartedly, you'll come out um, worse off. So that's always something, even to the the present day, is something that stuck with me. Um, so the 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 ability the quality was was very good um and with the five aside tournaments we would go all over we would kind of um come up to edinburgh out with um the borders itself and and compete against against other teams so it was it was quite nice to get that kind of different challenge that that different entity yeah and you obviously you played in boys teams and until secondary school what what happened then um, I, I think it's obviously still a, a rule at the moment. Um, so I, I couldn't play mixed football. Um, I think it was maybe 12, 13 um, that I had to stop playing playing with the boys, which for me, because it was all I ever knew, um, it was a little bit daunting. Um, 
So my dad, I think, saw an advert and, and probably shown my age here, but the pink paper, which is kind of the, the old equivalent of the, the evening news. So um, saw an advert in the pink paper to, to come up and trial at Meadowbank for um, Hibs under 17s. And kind of that's where my, my Hibs story began. Fantastic. So how, how old were you then when you... I think round about 12 or 13. I think the, the ages um, of girls playing with boys and mixed football has increased, but certainly back then it was uh, was round about 12 or 13. So you were 12, 13 playing for a under 17s Hibs women's side? Yeah, under 17s. Um, I, I don't know, again, someone who's not really phased. I was a little bit daunted about the prospect of coming into a new environment, meeting new people, but I think when you play any sport, when you've got a love and passion for the sport, all of those feelings, certainly in, in my experience, all of those feelings kind of just disappeared as soon as I got on the pitch and had a ball at my feet. So, um, yeah, it was it was different because it was a different environment. Didn't have have your kind of teammates, your um, who were of course boys um, around about you. So it was different in that respect. But at the end of the day, it was football and it's uh, the game and sport that that I love. Yeah, that must have been quite challenging physically as well. Obviously playing with girls that are like three, four, five years older than yourself. Yeah, I think so. I think, however, because up until that point I'd played with boys, I think naturally when when you, when you we've played boys in pre-season or friendlies or whatever, naturally they're quicker, faster and stronger. So I think that early introduction to kind of mixed football or boys football certainly stood me in good stead for, for going into an environment where I was playing it, playing with and against girls that, that were considerably older than me. I, I didn't really see and feel that kind of physical element um, being a massive, a massive gut. Yeah, and then obviously, was it was it during your time at Hibs and how early on was it when you thought actually football was something that, that I really want to take seriously and I'd, I'd like to play semi-professionally and then obviously professionally? Yeah, I think it was always always a dream and aspiration of mine but I think in those days because there were very few um, full-time female footballers it was something that I wanted to do but I actually didn't think it was ever going to be viably possible um, so yeah very early on I knew that football was was what I wanted to do and um, train week in week out for your, your game at the weekend but I didn't actually think it was going to be an opportunity for me given there was very few role models and and kind of environments that were full time in the the women's game not just up in Scotland but but down down south as well were you having to think of other career prospects then at, at the same time and what what kind of things went went through your mind did you try anything else not really i think when <laughs> when uh, i'm very headstrong yeah. when i was at school especially secondary school um loved pe of course um and down in the borders especially, it was very much the boys played rugby and the girls played hockey or netball. So because there wasn't that kind of girls-only football environment, they tried to shoehorn me into the, the hockey team and, and the netball team, which I did to an extent, but I was very much... Uh, they very much knew that I wanted to play football. So I think on the back of that, they, they started at, at secondary school a, a girls-only a girls only football team and environment so yeah it was always something that regardless of the barriers and the adversities it was something that I wanted to really really progress with. Yeah and obviously um, with your help Hibs have been able to to pioneer um, in terms of women's football and the women's football landscape in Scotland over the last few few decades but what what was it like in terms of the the game when when you were coming through, let's say 14, 15, 16, um, in terms of the competitive nature, then the number of teams in Scotland. Yeah, it was it was difficult. I think, um, of course, as I've kind of journeyed throughout my career, the the women's game has progressed. Um, but but certainly we were travelling far and wide to to compete, um, playing teams like Cove, playing um, elsewhere in the in the country. So. There has always been that competitive nature there, but I think it's hard to to compare then and now from a competitive side of things because it's advanced so much. We've got so much kind of off-field resource now that players who I played with early on 
like your Debbie McQuinnies, your Susie Robertsons, and people like that who played at the very top end of the game, it's hard to compare how a current Hibs team would fare against that yeah. team, just given the, the kind of different logistics. But yeah, it was always very competitive, um, not just in the league, but within the, the squad. I remember my, my first season after transitioning from 17s, um, I very much so sat, sat on the bench quite a lot. Um, but I appreciated what I was learning from those very, very good players and training alone was kind of standing me in good stead for, for what was what was to come. Yeah, well, let, let's talk about that then in terms of um, coming through the 17s and being around the, the first the first team squad. Um, you mentioned it there, obviously, the first year. You, you sat on the bench quite a lot. I can imagine for a very headstrong Joelle that really believes in herself, that must have been quite quite difficult. Yeah, it was. I think I've always had kind of a belief in my my ability. Um, so although I'm saying that I appreciated that I was going to learn a lot at training, I think in any sport, if you're not a number one pick or if you're sitting on the bench, it, it is always hard to to kind of get your, your head around. So that season was a, a very kind of transitional season. It was a, a season for learning, to be honest. And and thankfully, it was only that one season um, because the season after it's when I really kind of stamped my authority on the, the team and started getting getting more minutes on the on the pitch. Did your dad have to say to you, like, Joel, this is this is good for you in in the long term. Just stick at, at it, keep keep training, and you'll be able to use this as a, a learning experience. Yeah, I think he did. Uh, that was certainly a piece of advice of of many. He's a football man. He's a as I said, he played, he, he coached down in, in the borders and he's, he's a Hibs fan. So he did certainly keep me very, very grounded in those those early days. And although, I, as I said, I'm quite headstrong, he kept me on that kind of that path and that journey that, that I, I knew I could go down and, and hopefully be successful with. Then, am I right in saying your debut was against Arsenal? Yeah. Um, so when, when you talk about debuts and... Opposition, it's quite the the opposition and quite the debut. So yeah, I was thankful to to get on the pitch that day and not only play with but play against top class players. Am I right in saying at that point in time they were almost the leaders down in England, weren't they for for women's football? They were, yeah. Um, they were kind of the the pioneers of yeah. of the women's game down south. Um, we saw a large number of of players kind of transitioning down south. Um, players from this club. Kim Little obviously made the the move from, from Hibs down to, to Arsenal. Julie Fleeton, who of course didn't play for, for Hibs, but made a, a big name for herself down down at Arsenal. So they have been a team and a club who have really pioneered the women's game and, and still currently do. Yeah, and how old were you on your debut? I was, I think, 17, 18. Yeah, so, so that was immediately a... If you want to have a career in this, I suppose you're looking at those kind of people and thinking, "This is the level I I need to be at to to progress." And yeah, and I think it's a, a cliche in football. You always want to to kind of challenge yourself against the best players and the best teams in, in the game. And certainly that was that was a prime example of that. Yeah, and then obviously you you've gone on to have a absolutely glorious <laughs> career, both for for Hibs and and your country when you progressing through did you ever think wow I can't believe what I've achieved here is it only even I'd say now but you, you're still playing have you ever had a chance to really think wow look at what I've done like titles five Scottish Cups seven uh, League Cups have you ever had a chance to just think about that um not really I'm the type of person that if uh, yeah if people always ask me about parties and kind of landmarks and things like that but I'm the type of person that at a party, I'm very much sitting in the background. Um, I just like to keep myself to myself. So when you're talking about reflecting on what, what I've done, um, and don't get me wrong, I have, and I've been present in those those moments, but I think I've always appreciated that there's something else to come, there's something else to come. And um, I think that'll be the case until I stop playing. So yeah, I'm, I'm very kind of grounded in that respect. I think if, um, <coughs> excuse me, if there's anyone that, that kind of does that, it's my mum. When we're out, she's, of course, very, very proud of my achievements and stuff, and she'll mention it in amongst friends and stuff, so I very quickly try and shut her down, but <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, that's my mum for you. She's uh, 
very, very proud and loves talking about my achievements probably more so than than I do. Yeah, as she should be as as well. Um, well, let's talk about some of those triumphs then. Um, what what can you remember from your first like league title win and the the roller coaster with that and and how it was? Yeah, it was it was a, a very competitive season. Um, there was teams like Kilmarnock who were at the very top end of the game. Cove, who who I mentioned, teams who probably now I'm not even entirely sure if if Cove are competing um, in the top two or three tiers of the the women's game. But certainly when I broke through in that first kind of kind of title winning season, they were very very prominent. And I just always remember it. Um, obviously, I'm still a young girl playing with um, playing with adults, so. I remember the the title win and and the celebrations afterwards, um, and thinking this is this is definitely something that that I want more of and something that I want to to be a part of. Yeah, and then obviously, Scottish <coughs> Cup wins follow, League Cup wins follow. Is there one that really like stands out out for you? Yeah, I think for me, um, and up until this point, there was many kind of league and title wins and um, Scottish Cup wins, but the the twenty sixteen season was was very special under Chris Roberts um who's now managing down south um obviously for the club in itself yeah. was a, a very special year so for us to to win the Scottish Cup the same year as the the men won it um it was a double cup winning season for us because we secured the the league cup that season as well that certainly as a season and success that, that sticks out for me and will always uh, be the one that I kind of think back to when I'm talking about any any kind of trophies or title lifts. Yeah, absolutely. And then away from all of that, obviously there was Champions League football here at, at Easter Road as well. What, what was that like? I think every time anyone asks me about my Champions League experiences um, to date, the one that sticks out is of course, Bayern Munich here yeah. under the lights in front of at that point, which was a, a record breaking crowd. So, yeah, I think when you're talking about prestigious tournaments, Champions League is up there. Um, I think when you're talking about opposition in the game, Bayern Munich is a, a kind of world leading kind of brand and team. Um, and then just being here um, at the, the stadium that I came to when I was younger, watched my heroes on playing under the lights, I think just everything that that evening um, just played a special part in, in kind of my, my memories that will, will fondly be remembered. Yeah, absolutely. It was an incredible, incredible night here at Easter Road. And I suppose um, you, your family, although you've obviously won titles and cups, that probably would have been a, a moment they never thought they'd probably see. Yeah, I think so. I think even even for myself, it was special. Every time I I step step out onto the pitch um, at Easter Road. It's certainly a moment that I always, of course, like to be present in and and be very very proud of. Because when we're talking back into those early years, it was certainly something that I never ever thought would be would be possible. So to have done it on that evening um, and and kind of occasion since is is something that's is really a a pinch me moment. Yeah, absolutely. And then in terms of. Um, Internationally, uh, we have to touch upon Scotland. Mm. Obviously, what what was it like when you got your first call up? Yeah, it was again like everything else that I've achieved in the game. Very, very proud for for not only me but my family. I think my family for the early years, especially, kind of really, really stuck by me. Really, really kind of sacrificed a lot. Of course, coming from the borders, being quite remote a lot of the kind of central city facilities meant that, that they had to take me places not only midweek but at the weekend so they sacrificed um, a, a lot for me so of course when I got that first cap it was very very proud moment for myself but also also my family. Yeah and then obviously um, they got to see you compete in, in a World Cup as well again like you mentioned the sacrifices there but it makes it all worthwhile. Yeah, of course. And I think when you talk about sacrifices, like for me, football's all I've ever wanted to do. Um, so I don't even see it in my respect as a sacrifice because I'd play football over going out or doing anything like that. So I, I think the World Cup, the the Euros in 2017 and, and Holland um, kind of 
were the pinnacle of all of that hard work at club level, at youth national team level. And um, yeah, something that, that I'll definitely look back on and, and be proud to to be a part of those kind of historic occasions because the 2017 um, Euros final in, in Holland was the first time we'd, we'd qualified for a, uh, a championships. And then to do that two years later for the World Cup was, was yeah, definitely something that, that we're all very, very proud of. What, what were they like as experiences? Because obviously you, you go away, you're in a small small camp, you're among everyone for two, three, four week period. Games are coming thick and fast. There's not much you can do on the training pitch in between the games too. That would have been a completely different experience for yourself and, and probably uh, shows the progression of, of women's football at that point from where you'd started. Yeah, I think it was those camps were 24-7, of course, club football, you're, you're in and out, you're, you're back home, but those camps are quite intense. Um, but thankfully, I'd done, done it and experienced it with a lot of my friends. Um, I've made, made a lot of friends in football, not only at the club, but, but elsewhere. And was quite fortunate that I had a lot of friends um, in camp on, on both of those occasions. And I think the Euros was an eye-opener, but the World Cup in, in France was just different different to any of us even even players like Kim Little who have played at the top end of the game for for many years and experienced quite a quite a lot of players players like that who um kind of witnessed what what we witnessed it was quite a a momentous and kind of eye-opening and quite overwhelming experience and um, being welcomed off the bus by by the locals and things like that just the little touches that maybe your your kind of top top class players are are used to and come accustomed to it was quite quite yeah it was uh, overwhelming yeah absolutely and one one question I've I've been dying to ask you <laughs> the number seventeen talk to me about that so was it quite an unusual number for a starting centre back yeah well it actually came about so my date of birth is the seventh of November so seven has always been a, a number that that I've kind of um, been drawn towards so. When I came up to the women's team, of course, I wanted number seven, but I appreciated my place in the pecking order and in the team. So I um, wanted number seven, and number seven was actually won by um, Mandy Burns. Mandy comes from um, Glasgow, um, very West Coast. Nobody messed with Mandy, so it wasn't even a question. Um, so I thought, what's the next best thing? And 17 was available, and it's something that's, that's stuck ever since. And... I've been asked on, on multiple occasions, probably earlier on than, than uh, more recently, if, if I wanted to change to a number within the, the 11, and certainly um, it was a very much a, a swift no. Fantastic. And then throughout your, your, your long playing career, there's been a huge development in terms of women's football. Um, obviously now with Hibs going professional as well, how, how pleased are you to see that progression, the, the way that not just the local community in Edinburgh, but the world is now embracing women's football. Yeah, I'm absolutely delighted. I always get asked if um, I wish I was kind of playing my, my prime years now. Um, and my answer is always no, because I'm very proud and feel very privileged to have played a part in those early, early stages and the kind of progression and the development of the game. So, Although I'm not playing my kind of twenties and in the current day, um, I certainly wouldn't wouldn't change it for for anything because I'm happy with the part I played and and trying to get us to this point. And and don't get me wrong, none of us, I, I don't think anyone working in the women's game is is happy with where we we are at the moment because I think like anything, there's always something that could be could be done better. And I think if I'm speaking about the club um, here at Hibs and specifics, we're always looking to to kind of think outside the box and how we can progress and, and really take the women's game forward on and off the pitch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's, there's loads more to talk about, um, including off the field, um, your off the field roles at, at Hibs too. Just finally, I, I wanted to ask you um, in terms of your playing career, what, what did it mean to you when you were made Hibs captain, and then subsequently to lead the team out here at East Road? 
Yeah, it was, again, a surreal moment because I know um, the weight of, of that armband. I know the, the, the players that have worn the, the armband before, your Laura Kennedys, your, your Susie Robertsons, and those are, are big characters. And I maybe, I maybe questioned whether I could kind of fill those boots. Um, but it's a role that I've really kind of enjoyed, um, I've thrived on, um, and certainly not only taken to the pitch as a Hibs player, but taken to the, the pitch here at Easter Road as a as a Hibs captain is certainly something that I probably didn't even think was was doable when I was a, a little girl starting out playing. So as I said earlier, to, to have done that multiple times now is is certainly something that will 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 live long in the, the memory. Yeah, absolutely. And and obviously you incredibly busy. I think anyone that sees you around Easter Road, whether that be on a on a match day or in the office in the week. That everyone knows how how busy you are, how much you love the club. Obviously, for for yourself, you've been working with the club um, in terms of like the business capacity, but also with the women's team and in, in a coaching um, capacity as well. I just wanted to start firstly away from football in terms of your invo- involvement with Hibs Kids, because I know that's something that you take incredible pride um, about. Tell me why Hibs Kids is, is so important to you and why you wanted to take a leading role within that. Yeah, I think it's important to me because I appreciate that those young hybies are the, the future generation of, of the fan base, um, players uh, like myself who, who were Hibs Kids when, when, when I was younger, obviously trans, transferred into a fan, transferred into a player. So I, I believe it's, it's truly important for, for those reasons. I think engaging with, with young hybies at an early age really kind of captures the, the imagination and, and hopefully inspires them to, to go on and be whatever they want to be, whether it be a fan, whether they work for the club, play for the club. Uh, I think the, um, the opportunities are, are endless. So when the, the opportunity came about, it was certainly something that, I didn't even need to give it a second thought because I appreciated the importance of that demographic. Um, I think we always look at season ticket holders and, and things like that, but in my opinion, um, the Hibs kids, the, the junior demographic at the club are, are just as important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think people listening to, to this conversation and, and people that know you know that you always want to kind of go to the the next thing you're always looking to develop and progress yourself how has working on the office side changed that in terms of you as a person the way that you're thinking um and and the way that you do things yeah i really enjoy working in the office side Uh, i recently done a a football management course um and it certainly opened my eyes to the business side of of football clubs um so it just gives me a a different kind of a vision, a different focus and priority. So I kind of can leave my, my football and playing hat at the door and, and come into the office and, and look at the, the business side and, and how we can, we, we can be better and do better off the pitch. Um, and then, of course, the, the playing hat goes quickly back on and think about doing, doing better on the pitch. So, yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoy the office side, um, the non-playing football side, um, just as much as, as the the plain side. Yeah, and it, it would be remiss of me to say that, or not to say, sorry, that you've you've been obviously working on your coaching badges. You've been working with Grant as as part of the kind of first team coaching setup alongside playing as well. How how have you found that? I've enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed it. Um, I think this season I'll uh, I've taken a Thursday session or an element of the Thursday session and coming off the pitch and I don't know if they're just saying it but um, the girls say they really enjoy it so um, yeah that's that's always nice to hear um, but equally so if it's not as enjoyable I want to hear that as well because I think there's so many many learnings in that but it's something that I enjoy something that I appreciate um, football isn't isn't a, a lifelong career so or playing football sorry so for me it's thinking about the afters and and certainly coaching is, is something that um is something that really excites me. Um I've spoken to a lot of kind of ex professionals who have maybe regretted not thinking about post playing um sooner than, than they did. So for me it's always been something that's been 
in the forefront of my mind and if I can upskill myself whether it be coaching or or something else then it's certainly something that, that I want to do I think it's important as a player to kind of grow your your toolbox um, so that if something further down the line comes about you've already got the experience or or the qualification to to kind of take it from how how did you find that that balance so I remember speaking to David Gray about it um, in in one of these um, and and he said at the start going from being in the dressing room or to being a coach he obviously made that straight transition yeah. um, whereas yours is a little bit more of a kind of gray area in terms of being part of the dressing room but also part of the coaching staff how, how have you found that in terms of like the relationships with with the the rest of the girls because there, there is a a little bit of a split isn't there normally in, in terms of football dressing rooms and the coaching dressing room? Yeah, I think I found it and I think the girls have found it quite easy. I think there's a mutual respect there. Um, they respect me when I'm on the pitch playing and training with them and, and equally so if I'm trying to kind of deliver a session. So I've found it quite easy. I, I think probably the hardest part is, and uh, it sounds strange to say it because on the training pitch and on a match day, I don't think twice about maybe telling somebody they need to do better, but I've probably found that element of the coaching side um, a little bit of a struggle. Um, so if, I'd say, a player like Ellis or somebody else maybe doesn't do something quite right, it's uh, kind of vocalising it in a way that doesn't come across as quite aggressive. And yeah. I think, like I said, there's that mutual respect that the, the players know that that's a constructive criticism and it's only kind of coming across for, for the betterment of, of them. So, yeah, I think to summarise, I've, I've found it OK. Um, and as I say, I don't know if they're just paying me lip service when they're telling me it's good or yeah. not. But, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. I guess there's, there's a natural leadership as well that comes from being a captain that then when you're, you're going out onto the coaching pitch, anyway, you have that kind of natural authority and the relationship that probably helps with that transition. Yeah, I think so. There's so many kind of transitional skills and skill sets from being a captain, being a leader, um, taking that into kind of the coaching element and, and delivering a session. So I think, yeah, probably for me, the only element that I did kind of find a bit difficult and struggle with was that kind of critique and constructive criticism. But we're, we're all uh, adults and the girls up until this point have certainly take it in the, uh, the, the, the way that it's been, been meant. Yeah, and you've also obviously embraced uh, media work in terms of um, Hibs TV, pre-match shows, working closely with Cliff, but then externally as well um, with the likes of, of BBC Scotland. How much have you, you enjoyed that side of things as well? Because I know some players, they, they just don't, don't like doing it at all. Yeah, I love it. Um, and I've kind of been thrust into it in a way, or I was initially... Um, there was a discussion within the, the national team about getting more females kind of um, doing co-coms and things like that across various kind of channels. And I threw my name into the hat. And from there, it's been something that I've, I've really, really enjoyed. And I think obviously doing the Hibs TV stuff with Cliff, it's, it's fantastic to do. And um, I think elsewhere with, with BBC Scotland, it just gives you a different kind of outlook and vision and, um, appreciation for for the game as a as a whole, and I think all these different entities that we've spoke about certainly helps me on on the pitch because it gives me a different, like I say, appreciation for for various things. But the the media stuff, the commentary, um, everything like that, I've I've really enjoyed up until this point. And again, it's probably something that um, I know come come kind of retirement and post playing it's it's something that I can hopefully draw upon along with the coaching and kind of tie into to kind of some some sort of role that that I enjoy yeah absolutely and and obviously you are still a player now and approaching a a very significant landmark 500 games for for Hibernian women what, what does that that mean to you when you hit that 500 do you think it it all like get you emotionally a little bit of you you realize what you what you actually have achieved here yeah i think so however i think like like all the other kind of achievements and success it probably won't sink in until i i stop playing um so yeah to to hit the 500 will be 
unbelievable. There's obviously players currently at the club like Lewis and Paul who've who've done that. So to kind of be considered and spoken about in the same bracket as them is is yeah certainly something that's uh, quite overwhelming to to think about. But when I first started out at the club, I never never ever thought I would achieve. Uh, 500 or 499 at the moment and potentially 500 soon so yeah it's uh, certainly and will be a proud moment for uh, for myself and my family and they keep asking when it'll be and I <laughs> say well it doesn't really work like yeah. that um, because I think they all want to to be there and support me on the day so yeah I'll, I'll just need to wait and see when I when I get the nod and the call up from from Gran um, but yeah, it'll be a proud moment, um, but something that I probably won't fully reflect back on or um, appreciate until until I stop playing. I was going to say, does it feel significant? Yeah, it does. It does. Um, and again, I'm someone who likes to be present, um, but kind of keep my, my feet on the ground. Um, so it, it does feel significant and there's a lot of noise around about it which at times I probably don't like because of the person that I like to be, the person in the background and let other people take the, the spotlight. But I think for that one, certainly I'll, I'll be present, I'll, I'll celebrate it and uh, yeah, be very proud of myself for, for doing it. Yeah, you absolutely should be. Um, Joelle, I think we could, we could genuinely talk um, for hours. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you very much for, for joining us on the Hybrid Buzz. Thank you.